people do. Some people get frustrated by it. Uh, when I was a kid, I'll tell you this, when I was uh, uh, not a kid, when I was 18, 19, 20 years old and first came to the Lord, um, I, was, I was put off by rapture talk. I was, I was spiritually raised, I guess, in a church where the rapture was talked about a lot. Uh, and it should be. We are to look forward to the, bless, the return of the, our, our Savior. But as a young man, not a 55-year-old man, but as a young man who was looking forward to a lot of years, having not done anything, uh, I wanted to live. I didn't want to be raptured. I wanted to live my life like my mom did, like my dad did. I wanted my turn on earth. I wanted to do things. And so um, rest assured when you speak of the rapture and, the, and future events that when you speak to younger generations, you have, to be a, uh, you have to be sensitive to that. Have to be sensitive to that fact. We're all at a different place. Most people today, when you've gotten to 50 or older, uh, a lot of us, unfortunately, want the rapture to occur because it will solve all our problems. I'm telling you that is not a proper motivation for wanting the rapture to occur. Wanting the rapture to occur, we should want for the Father to be glorified, for the Son to be glorified, and as the rapture will glorify uh, the Son when He gathers all that the Father gave to Him, that should be our mind. We should think thoughts the way God thinks them, uh, not think, oh, I can't wait for that rapture because this life is not fun. We know that there's persecution in this life for the Christian. All that choose or desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. We know those things. The Christian says, uh, the Bible says them plainly. So, uh, proper motivation for end times. We should be properly motivated uh, for God to be glorified in all things, not just save me from this mess. Uh, we were called for this mess for such a time as this. I mean, we're Christians with Bible truths called to help guide uh, the world through the times in which we live. We are the lights. We're not to be covered. Uh, we're the city on a hill that's supposed to be uh, known by everybody that comes around. We're not to run from this. So uh, just be careful with your motivations. That's all. I say it to me as much as I say it to you. There are days when, uh, like my friend Andy Wood says, the rapture would be great because there's not a problem I have the rapture couldn't fix. But that's not a, you know, he says that jokingly, and of course it's a true statement. But our motivation should be different. Two different worldwide gatherings we talked about last time. A few more words about this. We'll be here tonight. We'll be here Sunday too. Two different worldwide gatherings of the Jews in the land of Canaan, the promised land, Israel. All, uh, all Palestine is how you hear it spoken of uh, today, but it never was. It, it's not. I could teach you that too, uh, the, where that word came from, and that for... Uh, for many, 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 many years, the Jews were known as Palestinians. But that would be a rabbit trail, and we don't have time for that. Maybe sometime we'll, we'll go through the parsing of the word Palestine uh, and see where it comes from. So uh, there is a regathering in preparation for judgment. We've talked about this. We're going to talk more about it tonight. There is a regathering where God brings the Jews that He has scattered out. He promised them. If you continue to disobey, I'll ramp up the heat. If you continue, I'll turn up the heat. If you continue, and, and things like famine and pestilence and all these things in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30, God promised them in the Mosaic Law, if you disobey, these things are coming. And so uh, there will be a regathering in preparation for judgment where he brings the Jews back into the promised land while they're still disobedient, God has to circumstantially, and we'll talk about this tonight, how is it that God brings a disobedient Jew back into the promised land? When the Jews are calling on the name of the Lord at the end of the second coming, that'll be an easy time for the Jews to come back because they will know they're going to meet Messiah in the land and the uh, lamb will lay with the, with the wolf and all those things. Everything will be wonderful. Everybody will, will be beside his fig tree and under his, uh, or under his fig tree and have his own vine and all these things the scripture talks about. That'll be easy to get the Jews to come back, to want to come back to Israel. 
But how is it that God, what is it that He has used historically to regather Jews who don't necessarily have a lot of faith in Him? Certainly don't have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. Even if they call on the name uh, uh, Yahweh, they certainly aren't uh, calling on the name of the Lord. How does He regather the Jews to prepare them for judgment and tribulation. And then the second regathering is a regathering to prepare them for Messianic blessing. When Messiah comes back, when Jesus comes back on the white horse, Revelation 19, Revelation 20. Uh, Isaiah 11, 11 is the verse we've been in. It says, then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover. So we've talked about there are two recoveries, two regatherings, and this one speaks of the second. We're trying to figure out which is the first. It will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time with His hand, His outstretched hand, always speaks of God's omnipotence, His all-powerfulness, that it, with the power that God has, He will recover the remnant of His people who will remain. And this is a worldwide regathering. Look at the places that are mentioned from Assyria, from Egypt. So that's north and south, Patros, Cush, uh, all over Elam, uh, Shinar, Shemad, Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. From everywhere he has scattered them, he will bring all the Jews back into the land. And they will, will reign uh, if, well, I can't say that, but they will be there under the rulership of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. It will be easy for them to go back then. Messiah will be present. He will send angels to gather them. The nations will send the Jews back happily, joyously, not kicking them out of the land. They will happily and joyously send the Jews back. It will be very easy for the Lord and His angels to regather Israel. <clears throat> so this term regathering then, the second regathering that occurs in Isaiah 11, 11 makes the first worldwide regathering something that we need to try to identify. When is the first regathering of Israel? Because this says there's only two. Um, I'm going to ask a question. Somebody answer for me. I hope in your minds you have thought that, wait a minute, Rick. God dispersed Israel for 70 years into the land of Babylon. In 586 B.C., God told the, the, the tribes of uh, uh, Judah and Benjamin that were living in the south, you're done. I'm exile. I'm kicking you out of the land. I've already kicked the northern tribes out in 722 BC. 150 years go by. The south doesn't get the picture, and he kicks the south out in 586 BC. According to the book of Jeremiah and according to history, we know they were there for 70 years. In 515 BC, the temple is restored. Israel has come back in the land under Zerubbabel. A hundred years later, Nehemiah comes back. Somewhere in between there, Ezra comes back. We've studied these books recently. But why is it that when God brings the Jews back from the 70-year captivity, the exile in Babylon, why isn't that the first regathering? You Bible students, tell me why. Why is when they came back into the land the first time, let me show you, look at this, the answer's on the board. Why wasn't that re, uh, I won't even say regathering. It wasn't a worldwide regathering. Look at the nations that are listed here from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinat, Hamat. When God sent Israel back into the land under Zerubbabel, where did they come from? From Babylon. It was being run by the Persians at the time, and Cyrus is the one that sent them back. But they came back from Babylon. They didn't come back from Egypt and from the islands. They came back from Babylon. Problem number one is it was not a worldwide regathering. When Nehemiah came back in the land, and like I said, we just talked about this at length the past month or so, when Nehemiah came back into the land a hundred years later, where did Nehemiah come from? From Susa, from Assyria, he was in the capital, remember? And he led a group back, not a large group, just a few. Uh, but it was never a worldwide regathering. She get lost? It was never a worldwide regathering. But there's another reason why. 
There's another reason why when God brought Israel back into the promised land, it wasn't the first worldwide regathering. And this is the answer. Look what the Bible says. What does the Bible say? How does it characterize that first regathering? Look what it says. Zephaniah 2, verse 1 and 2, Gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame, before the decree takes effect. Now remember them coming back from Babylon. God uses His servant Cyrus to allow them to go back to rebuild the temple. He sends Ezra back later to get worship uh, in uh, going again. He sends Nehemiah of the Persians uh, Artaxerxes sends Nehemiah back to rebuild the walls, the gates, the city of Israel. Everything, is, nothing is bad. God has just judged Israel for 70 years. It's time for restoration. The temple's rebuilt. The priesthood is reinstated. Uh, there's this wonderful procession where Nehemiah goes right and Ezra goes left, leading uh, with priests and the shofars, and they blow the trumpet, and they end up at the temple. I mean, Israel's at peace. They should have been. They should have enjoyed peace after they came back from Babylon. That wasn't a worldwide regathering. We're talking about a handful of Jews, 100,000 maybe. And Nehemiah only led about, or uh, uh, Zerubbabel only led 49,000 into the land. We're not talking about millions of people. They were still scattered. But look at what it says here. He says, the day passes like the chaff before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you. When Yahweh sent Israel back from Babylon, was his burning anger going? Or did it take 70 years for that to subside? And now he wants to restore a relationship with Israel. He, uh, under Nehemiah, they recommit. Ezra reads the law all day from, from morning to mid-afternoon, from daybreak to mid-afternoon. Mid uh, Israel recommits to the law. We said, remember, they made three promises. We won't intermarry. We won't, we'll we'll uh, recognize the Sabbath day. Remember these things? Israel was on a roll. They were doing well before the Lord until they broke their promise again. But that regathering, this is what I'm trying to say, that cannot be the first regathering. Isaiah talks about two. The second one will be wonderfully peaceful. The first one is a regathering for judgment. And God didn't send Israel back into the land to judge them. He had just finished judging them for 70 years. Before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you, before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you. So uh, this, this regathering, I just want you to have in your head, if you had that question, it's a great question. What about when they came back from Babylon? It wasn't a worldwide regathering, and it certainly wasn't a gathering for judgment. That's not what it was. Jews in the far country. I got this information, uh, if you're interested, from the Jewish virtual library. The Jews keep track of these things. If you go back into the Bible and you read a book like First Chronicles, you'll realize, oh my goodness, that nobody, uh, nobody works on their genealogical record the way the Jews do. Uh, the begats, the begats, the begats. He fathered him, and then he fathered him, and then he fathered him. Chapters after chapters after chapters in the book uh, showing how clearly Israel keeps their genealogy. Well, there's an outfit called JewishVirtualLibrary.org, and you can go and see. They keep a constant track of these things. You can see this regathering taking place because they know from all these countries where the Jews have come in, they know what the numbers were in 48, and they know what they are today. They keep track of these things, people that do these things. But Jews in the far country, the scattered nations coming back into Israel, I just want to show you some of these numbers. They're very interesting. This is recent. When Zerubbabel went back, he took a small cadre of people. The Jews never entered into the land in mass numbers until recently. Look at the numbers. In 1948, that's a significant number or, or year because it was 1948 when Israel declared their independence. Britain gave the land to the United Nations. The United Nations uh, divvied it out to the Jews and to the Palestinians. Even Lebanon and Syria's borders changed. A lot happened uh, in 1948. But in 1948, in the country of Egypt, 
And I'm going to show you three countries because it says that the gathering is worldwide from Assyria, from Egypt, from Patros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamat. Let's look at a couple of those countries and see if indeed God is bringing Israel back into the land. In Egypt in 1948, 75,000 Jews. How many think are there now? Huh? No, in Egypt. In Egypt in 1948, according to this JewishVirtualLibrary.org, there were 75,000 Jews in Israel. I'm trying to prove to you that a worldwide regathering is in fact taking place right now. Today, 10 what? 10,000 or 10 like this? Who runs Egypt? What religion runs Egypt? Muslim Brotherhood. When Amy and I went to Israel in 2018, when we were going to go into Jordan, the country of Jordan, we crossed the border on foot. We were in a luxury tour bus. We got to the border of Israel and Jordan, and all of us had to get off the bus get all our luggage. We look like a caravan of, uh, of refugees. These 40 people that are getting off the bus with all our luggage, we walked across the bridge into Jordan and we waited there what seemed like two or three hours for things to get cleared up and that subpar bus without an air conditioner to show up and take us on to Petra and the other places we saw in Jordan. Why did we have to change buses? Why, when we went across, I wish I had my passport here, I'd show it to you. You know, if any of you have passports, and maybe not all of you do, uh, but when you have a passport inside, when you go in and out of another country, they will stamp it. But not Israel. Israel does not stamp your passport. Israel puts a little sleeve in there and closes it up, hands it back to you. It's a stamp, but it's not permanent in your passport. Why is that? Because if you have an Israeli stamp in your passport, you are not going into a Muslim Brotherhood country, period. And so when we got to the border, our Jewish bus, our Jewish bus driver, and our Jewish tour guide were not allowed into the country of Jordan. That's run by Muslims. What is it that draws the Jews back into the land? What is it? What is it that in 1948 changed in Egypt so that from 75,000 Jews, all of a sudden these Jews hightailed it out of Egypt? What one word starts with an H? Hatred. How does God draw the Jew back into the land, the unbelieving Jew? Hatred of Israel. What's another word for that? Anti-Semitism. How's God going to do this? You, I'm just, this is a pastor uh, spitballing here. When the Jews are in trouble, they go back to the land. 1948, Assyria and Babylon, according to the Jewish virtual library. You wonder, uh, you say, this is horrible, this anti-Semitism. I agree. But God has historically in the last 75 years used, at least in these countries, Muslim hatred of Jews to get them out of those places and into the promised land. How's he going to regather them? Anti-Semitism is at least a piece of it. Assyria and Babylon, those are modern day Iraq. 150,000 Jews in 1948. Sworn enemies of Israel, of course. How many do you think live there now? I have no idea who these people are. Maybe they're in some American embassy. Uh, I don't know where they get the four from, but that's the number the JewishVirtualLibrary.org puts out. Four. From 150,000 to four. Is Aliyah taking place? Are the Jews leaving lands and going back into the promised land? The answer is yes. 1948, Hamath, which is modern-day Syria. 
40,000 Jews. Today, according to these folks again, four. They're not welcome there. That's why I told you the story of stopping on the bridge and having to walk across the bridge. Jews can't go into these places. And Israel knows as a service to people that come in uh, bringing their money, their uh, uh, tourist dollars into Israel, we don't want to disrupt your passport. We won't stamp it. And they don't. One more, Elam, which is modern-day Persia and Iran. Now, let's not make this mistake. Uh, Persians are different than Arabs. Uh, they may be Muslim, but they're different uh, from Arabs. And they will tell you, if you call an Iranian uh, a, a, a Muslim, they will tell you, or an Arab, they will tell you right away, I am no Arab, I am Persian. They're they're. Persian Empire holdouts, right? They're proud of their heritage. That's okay. But in Elam, which is uh, listed here, one of these countries where all these people are going to be gathered back in unbelief, there was 100,000 there in Persia. There's 9,300 there today. Not quite the stronghold in Iran still uh, that the other Muslim Brotherhood countries have. But look at the number. I mean, that's 10%. 90% are gone. 9,300 are left there. Is, is there a worldwide regathering using the names that the Scripture talks about here that He will regather these people? Are, these, are they coming back from those lands? The answer is yes, they're coming back from those lands. They're being kicked out of those places. Pure hatred is kicking them out. And where do you go when you're kicked out? Well, you go home. And that's what they're doing. Another slide, a couple more facts, just to show you, uh, to try to um, show you this pushback into the land. Anti-Semitism's play in this. It's part that the Lord has used. Just let me show you some dates. In 1881, there were 25,000 Jews living in the Promised Land. So a second ago, we were looking at countries that were divesting of Jews, sending all their Jews back, kicking them out of their lands. And now we have Israel starting from 25,000, and let's watch Israel grow. In 1881, 25,000 Jews living in the land. Of course, you know this is a, somebody's estimate. Um, <clears throat> but look at by 1914. So we're talking about what, 30 years? Just before World War I, roughly 80,000 Jews in the land. I want you to start thinking right now. Don't spit out a number, but I want you to start thinking of how many Jews are in Israel today. In 1914, right before the First World War went from 1914 to 1917, but just before the war broke out, roughly 80,000 Jews in the land. You go another 30 years down the corridors of time, we have another world war, and just before World War II, World War II, remember who uh, reared his ugly head just before World War II? Just before World War II, roughly 400,000 Jews in the land. Are they making recent Aliyah? Are they going back to the land? I mean, in a 50-year span of time, they went from 25,000 to 400,000. This is within 100 years of us living on this planet. They've been out of the land for 2,000 years, and in the last 100 years, they're going back to the land. 1939, the war breaks out. Roughly half a million Jews in the land. Call it half a million. Close enough. In 1945, after the World War ended, the Jews garnered worldwide sympathy due to Hitler's Holocaust. Right? The world finally had to come to grips with anti-Semitism and they watched these things. They watched the Nuremberg trials on television, uh, those that had them. They heard it on the radio. They watched these things happen. They realized this can't happen again. This should never happen again. How is it that we allowed, how is it that this uh, sane world allowed this madman to kill six million Jews in Germany and Poland? So after World War II, the Jews garnered worldwide sympathy to, to Hitler's Holocaust. What's one word that describes the Holocaust? Starts with an H. Hatred. Hatred. 
1948, three years after the war ended, Britain, Great Britain, England, were in control of the land, a late Ottoman Empire, and the Brits handed the promised land over to the United Nations. And the United Nations divvied up the land. There were 650,000 Jews in the land. They were making quick Aliyah now because they realized they weren't safe anywhere. Those that didn't leave for Argentina and different countries, the United States of America, there were mass exoduses of, of uh, Jews during, uh, from Eastern Europe and, uh, and even Western Europe right before the war. 38, 39 smart Jews reading the, like, like uh, Winston Churchill did, not a Jew, but a smart man seeing what Hitler was capable of. The Jews that were in Europe took off those that had the means. They got out of there. Six million of them were killed that couldn't get out and stayed. So in 1948, we see this event where Britain hands the promised land to the UN. 1948, that's not very many years ago, and there were 650,000 Jews in the land. In May four, on May 14, 1948, that is a very important date, Israel declared its independence. We are a sovereign, independent, self-governing nation. We are the Jews. We're back in the land. 1948, May 14, Israel declares its independence, and immediately, immediately war breaks out with Egypt. Look at these. What, what is that? <laughs> it's just comical to me. It's so horrible that it's comical sometimes. What is it that when uh, things like 9-11 happen or when, uh, uh, when, when Muslims show their true colors, and I mean their true colors, according to Quran and their uh, walk with Allah, what is it that the Muslims, what is it that the world cries out in defense of the Muslims? It's a religion of peace. It's a religion of peace. May, 19, May 1948, Israel declares its independence and immediately the Arab nations that are religion of peace nations immediately go to war with Israel. They were getting bombarded on every side. You think Gaza and Lebanon, Syria is bad right now with, with Hamas and Hezbollah? That's nothing compared to what they went through in 1948. So war breaks out with Egypt, with Jordan, with Iraq, with Syria, with Lebanon, and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, they all came in to Israel to try to stop what was happening. You go down another 20 years, we're talking about the numbers in Israel growing. Don't lose sight of this. I just have to put some historical fact in here so we know what we're talking about. June 5th, 1967, a famous war called the Six-Day War. Jews regain the city of Jerusalem. Now that's important because next time we get together, I'm going to show you how Jerusalem is at the center of all of this. Jerusalem and especially the Temple Mount. The Six-Day War, the Jews regain the city of Jerusalem. How long had it been, somebody tell me, how long had it been since the Jews had control of the Temple Mount? Not a Gentile nation, not a Gentile empire, when the Jews had independent control of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where Yahweh once shone as the pillar of cloud and the, and the pillar of fire at night. 2,000 years had gone by. 2,000 years had gone by. The Romans owned it. The Ottomans owned it. All kinds of people owned it. Uh, the Byzantines, you can throw them in between there. All kinds of people were in control of Jerusalem, but Israel independently, as an independent nation, had never had control of Jerusalem since A.D. 70. Are they being regathered? Is there significance to the fact that Israel is back in the land? Of course there is. Are they being regathered as, a, as part of the Lord's regathering of Israel? Is He using hatred and anti-Semitism for them to flee where they are and go back to their own land? Of course He is. 
It'd be very difficult to get an obstinate, stiff-necked, I mean, I'm using the words that God uses, you're a stiff-necked, stubborn people, it would be difficult to get them to go back. Not for God, for you and me. And he uses circumstance, and part of the circumstance was Hitler's Holocaust, and part of the circumstance is anti-Semitism today. We all hate those things. I'm not saying they were okay. But it's part of God's plan to get Israel to realize we won't be safe anywhere until we're in our own land with our own army defending ourselves to the teeth. It's the only place we'll be safe. The world hates us. We have to go home. I told you recently, I think I told you that Bill Katz, you know Bill Katz, our uh, Hope for Israel uh, missionary, Bill Katz told me that uh, things in New York City are so dangerous that when he goes there to minister, he has been told by the people in New York City that he cannot use the subway, that he should not use the subway because he's Jewish and it's just that dangerous. So instead of using $2 and taking the subway trip to the airport, now he has to use an Uber that costs $65. Why? Hatred. Hatred that's bubbling up worldwide now. After this October 7th debacle that took place in Gaza, worldwide we're seeing people whose anti-Semitism was just one layer deep and all of a sudden you're seeing all this pro-Palestinian nonsense all around the world from people that should know better. <clears throat> In the present day, there are roughly 6 million Jews living in the Promised Land. Is God calling them home to prepare them for judgment? Yes. From 25,000 in 1881 to 6 million that is a massive calling home of his people, Israel. Massive event taking place. It's taking place right now. We know that they're being gathered. The regathering is in process. Uh, I want to show you, I told you about these particular verses uh, last time where the second regathering, the regathering at the second coming, when the Jews rushed back into Israel to greet Messiah and all these things, uh, I told you that there were some verses in the Bible that say that that second regathering is going to be so spectacular, such an event on earth, that the Jews will no longer speak of the exodus out of Egypt. Here are those verses. In Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. I got three verses on the board, or three different sections of the Bible, two from Jeremiah, one from Isaiah. I want to show them to you. In Jeremiah 16, verse 14, Therefore, behold, this is the second gathering that Isaiah 11 speaks of. The gathering and preparation for Messianic blessing for the millennial kingdom. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh. Out of the mouth of God these things are spoken, when it will no longer be said. As the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt... They won't, you read that all over the Old Testament. The God who with an outstretched arm and a mighty hand brought Israel out of Egypt over and over and over. All the prophets use this. David uses it. The psalmist use it over and over. This phrase showing the love of God, protection, provision of God, and the power of God and how he defeated the strongest nation on earth, Egypt, and had them usher the Jews out giving them all their clothing, their silver, their gold. Please leave the power of God. It was quite an event on earth, but God says something is coming. This is the you ain't seen nothing yet verse. There's something coming that will make the Exodus, the Red Sea, all of those things you know about how I got Israel free from Egypt. It'll be nothing compared to what I'll do next. He says, but as this is what they will say instead, but as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north and from all the countries where he had banished them, for I will restore them to their own land which I gave to their fathers. That regathering is going to be so spectacular that Israel will shift from as the Lord lives who brought us out of Egypt to as the Lord lived who gathered us back from the nations of the world. Jeremiah 23, verse 7 and 8. 
Therefore, behold, very similar, but a couple of different Hebrew words. Therefore, behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, but instead they will say, as the Lord lives, who brought up and led back the descendants, led back angels. Remember, he will send his angels, Jesus says in Matthew, to the four corners of the earth to gather his people. They will be led back by God's messengers who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land and from all the countries where I have driven them, then they will live on their own soil. Coming events. And one more, Isaiah 43, verse 18 to 19. Look what Isaiah has to say. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Put them out of your head. Again, you ain't seen nothing yet. Don't think about those old days because what God's going to do in the future is bigger. Do not call to mind the former things or ponder things of the past. Behold, I will do something new. Now it will spring forth. Will you not be aware of it? I will even make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. The Euphrates River being dried up, being a highway for the Jews to come back from the northeast. I'll make a roadway in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. But don't talk about the Exodus anymore because when you see what I'm going to do in the procession of Jews coming back into the land, you'll never, ever forget it, ever. I can't wait to see that. Can't wait to see it. We'll pick up right there next time. <clears throat> Still talking about this unbelief, uh, regathering and unbelief. I'm spending time here because I want you to understand the validity of a regathering and unbelief so that he can prepare them for judgment. The tribulation is a time of judgment, not only for the Gentiles, but for the Jews who will finally, by the end of the seven years, fall on their knees and cry out to Yahweh, uh, to, to Jesus, the Messiah, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It, they will have to be broken to get to that. They will have to be judged. They will have to be punished. It'll be severe. Uh, but that is what will bring Israel around to recognize Yeshua as the Messiah finally. We'll pick up here next time. Let's close in prayer.